Well, thank you so much for being here um, today. My name is um, Sixto Montesinos, and my presentation is entitled Surpassing La Cucaracha and the Mexican Hat Dance, the importance of diversifying um, in, uh, instrumental repertoire for instrumental ensembles. Um, I, my name is Dr. Sixto Montesinos. I serve as Sixto Montesinos, I serve as an assistant professor of music at head, head of instrumental studies at St. Mary's College of California in the San Francisco Bay Area. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Brian Messier and the entire production team here at the Hop, uh, Hopkins Center for the Arts for this opportunity to present about this important and interesting subject uh, today. I believe uh, the mission of uh, this Mexico Music Symposium aligns with my research and scholarly activities um, aimed to present Mexican culture as a multidimensional, rich and complex um, art form, despite being often misconstrued as a one, um, one dimensional, as a result of really limiting stereotypes that have emerged mostly through a lens of white privilege in, in certain cases, even um, white supremacy. So this is a quick overview for today's presentation. Um, first, I'm going to give uh, I'm going to present and discuss um, some stereotypes and caricatures that uh, limit uh, a variety in Mexican-inspired repertoire for instrumental ensembles. Um, next, I'm going to present um, some evidence of a lack of thematic diversity for this Mexican-inspired repertoire as of today. Um, and while emphasizing the importance of the Mexican Repertory Initiative collection here that is launching this weekend at the symposium. And um, third, um, I will argue the importance of diversifying this Mexican inspired repertoire, especially for our students in the years ahead. For example, why is this mission important? Why does this particular generation of students care about stereotypes and caricatures? Um, and in conclusion, I will share some ideas for composers, arrangers, editors, and educators to support diversifying this specific repertoire and surpass overused and stereotypical themes like fiesta or la cucaracha or even uh, viva Mexico. Um, I will also speak of the importance of Mexican representation in composers, teachers, and performers for the benefit and inspiration of younger generations. So before I go into it, I just wanna uh, say something really briefly and uh, somewhat personal about just my work uh, with this in, on stereotypes. Um, this has been with me since I was about 10 years old. Um, I, uh, I'm, my, I'm from Mexico City and my family's from Mexico City and we uh, moved to Houston, Texas when I was about 10 years old. And um, I had somewhat of a privileged childhood in Mexico City. I was, um, my parents are art lovers and music lovers, and they took me to see all the murals and the museums and the concerts. I saw Eduardo Mata conduct the Wapango when I was 10 years old. And that's what made me want to, that's what made me want to be a conductor. Um, and I would see the architecture of Bellas Artes in Mexico City, and I knew that it, I knew that the culture was so diverse and so incredible. But when I moved to the United States and I went to school in middle school, uh, I, I realized that what my idea of Mexico was, uh, wasn't quite the idea that my uh, classmates and the people that I was in school with had the perception of it. It was completely different and a disconnect. And a lot of it had to do with the stereotypes and the way that they perceived Mexican culture. And so it always bothered me as a kid. And, um, and so when people ask me that question, often people ask, well, what's your biggest pet peeve? I will always tell them it's like, it's stereotypes in, in Mexican not music, but just in Mex Mexican culture in general. And so now that I'm, I'm in a position um, of, of research and, and, and doing all these um, talks now I'm 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 really it, I feel like it's come full circle so today when we were doing the Orozco tour I really felt like it was finally the the the, I, the perception that I've, I've had about Mexico right about growing up going to these museums and the the, the murals and I knew that all these things happened exist 
that now it's all come together um, in, in this way. And so it's somewhat of a serendipitous experience, a kind of surreal experience to be here. And so I just wanted to take a little detour and give you a personal note on that before I dive really into this, more of this presentation. So, uh, but speaking of my childhood, um, I'd like to start, you know, taking a trip down to Houston, Texas. And I know we have some Houstonians in the building. Um, and so if you are from Houston, you probably are familiar with this image. Um, it is a supermarket uh, chain located in Houston and its suburbs called Simply Fiesta. And um, as a kid growing up in a Mexican family, trips to the supermarket were a regular weekly pilgrimage for groceries. Uh, there my parents could find all the delicious um, imported Mexican food they needed. And for me as a kid, most importantly, Mexican candy. I love Mexican candy and still do. Um, but every time I visited in my childhood, I had this question in my head of why this supermarket named Fiesta? Uh, you know, Fiesta is like the Spanish word for party. And so the first time I heard my parents tell me that we were going to Fiesta, I thought we were literally going to go to a party at someone's house, not to buy groceries. So I was really disappointed when it was. Um, but years later, um, but years later, I deduced that perhaps the reason why the founders of the supermarket named it Fiesta was a very interesting cultural association that happens often between all things Mexican and Fiesta themes. And so after I realized this, I started seeing it, um, this association everywhere I went, um, in restaurants, um, ad campaigns, Instagram, TV shows, movies. Um, and so years later, I realized that this connection of fiesta themes in Mexican culture is actually more than just a coincidence. And I decided to identify it as a distinct stereotype. Uh, and I named it the fiesta stereotype. And I discovered, as I just mentioned, that fiesta stereotypes are still really prevalent um, in everyday life. Um, and that fiesta themes have indeed been associated with uh, Mexican culture for decades, especially in the United States. So I want to emphasize, though, that I don't consider these stereotypes, fiesta stereotypes, to be offensive um, in the same way other stereotypes might be uh, or are. Um, after all, we know there is nothing offensive about connecting Mexican culture with fiesta themes that represent a wonderful, true, harmless facet of Mexican culture. And it's a very important part of what Mexico is, is, is the celebrations and that, that beautiful spirit. Uh, and additionally, I really also like that fiesta represents community and togetherness and all good things, right? But uh, the fiesta stereotype is problematic in a way because it mostly inspires caricatures that overshadow the tr this true authentic beauty of Mexican fest what festive and folklore really is. And it's also, it's, so it's in a way, it's just, be it's just very limiting and it just shows you one very limiting uh, thing. So, for example, I mean, there's one. Um, I, I found this cartoon uh, on the internet of the Ford Fiesta, and here is a car, the car wearing a giant Mexican sombrero. Uh, in, in, in this example, the, the simple name Fiesta inspired um, the cartoonist to associate this American-made car by Ford Motor Company which by the way uh, is one of the pillars of modern day Americana with a giant and ridiculous Mexican sombrero. Um, and this is really interesting. Uh, the fiesta stereotype actually manifested itself very recently in my day to day life. Um, as of three weeks ago, um, I went to have lunch at Oliver Hall at the campus of St. Mary's College of California where at my place of work. And when I enter the service uh, stations on Cinco de Mayo, I discovered that dining services company Sodexo had decorated the entire self-service stations with cardboard caricatures uh, of what they thought um, represented Mexican culture. 
So you, have, you can see the usual suspects, a fiesta, cactus, and then you have a hard shell taco, which by the way, they're not really, hard shell tacos really not a thing. Um, uh, with a sombrero, is maracas exclaiming ole, which by the way, I'll speak about ole in a, in a second because ole is really not a Spanish idiom and not really a Mexican. But, um, and then here's another one, uh, a little sombrero and uh, a donkey or a burro. So, um, you know, while I'm sure, uh, I, um, 100% sure, really, that our dining services department meant no harm with these decorations, uh, and I was personally not offended by it, uh, but I thought there was a better way to decorate in honor of Mexican culture and, and represented for Cinco de Mayo. For example, Mexico has exceptional artisanship that could have been used as decorations, you know, instead of these... Uh, tragic cardboard caricatures from probably Party City or who knows. Um, but perhaps the most pressing issue about the well-intentioned fiesta stereotype is that it limits the current landscape of thematic variety in compositions written, written for young instrumental groups, uh, as we will see soon in specific musical examples. So, for some more context, uh, I found a possible explanation as to why and when Mexico became associated with festivity so much. Um, obviously, it is difficult to pinpoint an exact moment when this originated, but I learned that during the colonial period, um, the Spanish brought to Mexico La Fiesta Brava, uh, also known as the Bullfighting Festivals. And these lively and sometimes deadly festivals center around the matadors who are often dressed in flamboyant and beautiful outfits um, that, by the way, later, later on inspired mariachi attire. Um, and La Fiesta Brava is characterized by large rowdy crowds and pyrotechnic celebrations, and in most cases, street music performed by Spanish folk marching bands showcasing musical genres that you've probably heard of before, like the flamenco, the paso doble. Um, and then later in the first half of the 20th century, fiesta stereotypes were amplified in the U.S. by Hollywood uh, in the U uh, in performing arts organizations uh, aided by the U.S. government during a very interesting time period in American history called the good neighbor policy between 1935 and the mid-1940s. And in summary, uh, the American government led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to ensure that countries to the South uh, perceived the United States as good neighbor and an ally of, in, um, of uh, in not an interventionist country or in simpler terms, like a bully, right? So FDR's strategy to be a good neighbor was also a preventative measure as well because the U.S. was concerned about any potential connections between the growing powers of Nazis in Germany and South American countries with clear tendencies to collude with authority or authoritative regimes, which we know some of them were kind of like Argentina, perhaps. And so they were a little worried. Uh, so to realize the mission of this good neighbor policy, uh, a far and wide cultural appropriation of everything South American manifested in the US basically as propaganda, mostly in the way of films and music. And this obviously included Mexican folklore. Um, I find it fascinating that the US government sent many VIPs uh, in the performing arts world down to South America during this time as goodwill ambassadors, including luminaries in the music world, like Bing Crosby, Grace Moore, and even someone we know very well, um, Aaron Copeland. It is important to note that this cultural appropriation of everything Latin America that started uh, in the 1930s as a result of the good neighbor policy was done mostly, if not entirely through the lens, the, through the male dominated lens of very rich and powerful white Americans like FDR, people in his cabinet and in Hollywood specifically in particular, Jack Warner, Louis B. Mayer, and of course, someone we all know, Walt Disney. So here is a clip of a 1935 Good Neighbor era film, 
La Fiesta de Santa Barbara, which is their La Fiesta one more time, um, featuring uh, the Fiesta stereotype as well as a young uh, Judy Garland uh, singing a Mexican folk song that would transcend into popular culture, but unfortunately in most instances as an undesirable caricature. Sitting over there is the hombre who is making hey hey with the señorita while the sun she is shining, eh? Señor Paul Pocasi. <laughs> Santa Barbara, Palo Alto, Tijuana, Caliente, Albuquerque, and Tijuana, San Diego, and Hoboken. Oh. La Cucaracha. Oh. The poor little cockroach, she's a die. La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha, ya no puede caminar. So, as you can see, caricatures drive this clip completely. And I'm struck by the careless and confusing mixture of different folklore. For example, there are matadors from Spain and a burro and a donkey and with Mexican sombrero and a Spanish lady playing maracas. And, uh, you know, uh, at one point, one of the characters speaks in an Italian accent, which is a little confusing. Um, so, uh, while we could say that films like these are harmless and the, you know, the truth, but they, they, they're, you could say they're harmless, but the truth is that with the, their wide reach and commercial success um, that they had, uh, they, I think they contributed or probably jump-started the, this perpetuation of caricatures and stereotypes in Mexican culture in the United States and maybe even other countries. So this cringeworthy film, uh, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but it was nominated for an Academy Award for an Oscar for best uh, short film in 1930, 36, 30, 35. So other commercial successes um, from uh, the Good Neighbor Policy uh, include uh, this movie Fiesta, uh, branded as MGM's biggest technical or spectacle, featuring the Fiesta stereotype loud and clear as the headlining title and its singer with singer and actor Actress Esther Williams opposite the tokenized Mexican actor Ricardo Montalban. Uh, it's needless to say that in the 1930s, Hollywood uh, white actors uh, were cast to play Mexican characters, and that true representation of Mexican actors in Hollywood was dismal. Um, few exceptions of tokenism, with a few exceptions of tokenism. So, other good neighbor uh, caricatures, uh, films, or Disney. Saludos Amigos, Saludos Amigos, and uh, South of the Border with Disney, and of course, when we all know the Three Caballeros. So I've taken a slight detour here in order to just give you the context of where these stereotypes might be coming from and caricatures. But now I want to talk about why we are really here which is the music. So how does fiesta stereotypes and caricatures manifest um, today in the landscape of instrumental ensemble repertoire for orchestras and bands and jazz? Um, so if you go to a very popular sheet music uh, website vendor um, that we all know and love called uh, JW Pepper um, and type in the word fiesta, on the search, uh, these are some of the results uh, that you will get. Um, you have 12 fiestas, all by you know different 
authors. And then you have some theme, theme and variations. You have Fiesta on the Housetop, Fiesta Fantastique, Holiday Fiesta, Mexican Fiesta, Fiesta Rock, Santa's Fiesta, for it's Christmas time, Fiesta Española, Fiesta Sunrise, A La Fiesta Viva, Fiesta Winter Fiesta, Fiesta Procesional, Fiesta Time, Island Fiesta, Fun Fiesta, Fiesta Time. Again, there's two of them, uh, Fiesta Time. Trumpet Fiesta, if you have a trumpet section that's really good, you can program that. La Fiesta, Latin Fiesta, Fiesta Blues, if you want to get a little jazzy with Fiesta. Uh, Fiesta Tonada, Fiesta Barra, Fiesta Fantasy, Fiesta Val, which is maybe a play on word for festival, but Fiesta Val, right, I guess. Uh, Fiesta Grande, okay. Uh, Fiesta Nueva, oh, that's a new one. Uh, Fiesta Gasparilla, Fiesta March, Fiesta Tropical. Uh, kitchen fiesta, that's an interesting, like, okay, kitchen fiesta, I don't know if they're, maybe they're playing with utensils or something. Uh, La Fiesta Mexicana and Fiesta del Pacifico are actually two very important works for wind band, uh, so I won't make fun of those. Um, fiesta La Vida, um, and then you see just, uh, I won't go through all of them, but you see these just still concert bands, and they're all just fiesta and really weird, nonsensical themes and then you have string orchestra as well some fiestas for string orchestra and fiesta mexicana at the end siesta fiesta that one rhymes right so um so this is this is precisely the reason i decided to construct this presentation uh and furthermore why we cannot underestimate the mission and importance of the symposium uh you know there is little diversity in this Mexican themed uh, repertoire for instrumental ensembles at the moment with this, we're talking about mostly about pieces that uh, uh, high school bands are playing, right? The students are playing it, pieces for younger ensembles. Um, and this is due, I think in part deeply rooted uh, in due to these deeply rooted stereotypes and caricatures that were, perhaps enhanced or jump-started during the good neighbor policy, uh, cultural phenomenon, and well into the 20th century. Um, other common themes, uh, similar to the fiesta theme, uh, are, you guessed it, La Cucaracha, Mexican Hat Dance, La Bamba, and Viva Mexico. Um, so, oh, so in order to surpass these caricatures and limited works, uh, we need to debunk these stereotypes, right? So for, you know, for example, we can collectively declare today that Mexican themes in music don't always have to celebrate the Cinco de Mayo festival, break a piñata, or depict a breezy vacation of tropical climate, right? Mexican inspired music can and should also be pensive, reflective, mystical, suspenseful, enlightened, metaphysical, scary, angry, melancholic, right? Why not? Um, and, and so this is a clip. Oh, this is, this is a Juan Pablo's new piece that I heard this morning. And this is, I added this last minute to the presentation, like literally last minute, uh, because uh, I really do think that uh, this new piece, and encourage everybody to go on Spotify and Apple Music and really listen to it, because I think this piece is really captures this idea that um, it, it is it, that the Mexican music, themed music, because this is inspired obviously by Mexico and it's 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 beautiful Pacific Ocean, that it can it's this beautiful mystic and and grand and it, piece of music very rich. And so I, I really think that these two go, it, it, it's a great example of this statement and uh, how, you know, not all Mexican music has to be celebration, right? There's so much more to be inspired by. Um, so uh, next, I'm just going to get a little more specific, uh, to, you know, um, with repertoire and problematic caricatures and stereotypes and inaccuracies. Uh, I wanted to find a particular piece of music that shows a clear connection between the good neighbor policy era and today, um, or somewhere, you know, 2015 is rather recent. Um, so here are three versions of the 1945, 1960, and 2015 um, of this crowd-pleasing but somewhat stereotypical piece called La Bamba de Veracruz, written by actually an Argentinian composer named Tarek Tucci. 
Um, so this is the first one. <laughs> version as you can hear it sounds very spanish that dun, 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 you can um and then a 20 and it's the 20 2015 version here <laughs> So as you can see, this is a good example, like that we are still taking music from this era, right? And 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 it's this is still it's showing up to, in today's repertoire. So the but the first thing I noticed actually is not related to the music. Um, I, I noticed that the title has been reckless recklessly uh, misspelled um, for many years. Um, the word Veracruz was published in two words, right? So Veracruz is a very popular and beautiful state in um, Mexico, by the way, and misspelling its name would be the same, somewhat the same as misspelling Mississippi, like if you said Missy, Mississippi. Um, so it's unclear to me why the name Veracruz was misspelled for the, from the get-go, but I can probably assume carelessness. Um, and in the 1960 version, also has the name misspelled as well. So the, the, the now defunct Sam Fox company did not uh, correct the name at the time and even published the misspelling in the score. However, in the new version, newest, newest version, 2015, the name is spelled correctly, but almost 70 years later. Um, another thing I found particularly interesting about this piece was the important role of the castanets in the orchestration used to supposedly evoke the sound of the Mexican bamba in Veracruz. Uh, so listen, uh, listen again to this. <laughs> So one of my biggest concerns, and it's always been since I was very young and I was playing in bands, band arrangements since I was in middle school, um, was concerned about this that Mexican-inspired repertoire today is that it's very often composers and arrangers use castanets to depict Mexican sounds. And so I'd like just to point out, you know, that castanets are a very important percussion instrument in Spanish flamenco dance, and therefore, in my opinion, should not, should not be used to evoke Mexican sounds in these pieces. The use of castanets in Mexican-inspired repertoire also reflects a bigger issue, though, uh, an inability for some to differentiate between what is Mexican and what is Spanish, right? So uh, furthermore, like these gray areas between what is Spanish and what is Mexican, uh, it also impede this decolonization efforts that are, a lot of times we're trying to do now. Um, so here's a little bit of my sense of humor um, in the whole thing, you know, with this popular meme, you know, our castanets in Mexican theme, uh, you know, uh, when composers use this castanets, I'm like, what? Is it a deal breaker, right? Um, when programming a piece, I think to some is probably not 
but to me it is right so as a conductor it is always important for me to make informed choices when programming music for our groups and i like to get as close and authentic as possible if i adopt specific a specific theme in a composition and so i want to really adequately present that to an audience and performers um so i probably won't program a piece that has the castanets in it if it's a mexican theme because I, like I said, I like to make these informed decisions. So additionally, uh, and, and also additionally, I always assume that I will have a student or a player or a performer in my group or someone in the audience who will recognize these inaccuracies, disconnects and caricatures because um, I, have, I have and still always do that when I go to concerts. I am that person. <laughs> um, so I never underestimate my players or my audience members and what they know about Mexican culture. Um, these are a few inac. So now uh, these are a few examples of inaccurate and sometimes offensive titles as well as editor descriptions that try to make this repertoire appealing to consumers online. Some are more cringeworthy than others. The first one I found is a piece called South to Cabo for concert band. The publisher's description reads, featuring a fun melody with an island style, South to Cabo gives variety to any program. All parts are playable by the youngest students, but also often uh, offer certain challenges. Watch your students move to the fiesta feelings uh, depicted in the music um, from the Baja region. So, Viva la Festival. Um, so, Three things really stood out to me. Um, first, the words fiesta feelings. Um, although it's a cute alliter alliteration, it brings back to focus the limiting and widespread fiesta stereotype that we talked about earlier and in this presentation. And then the words Viva la Festival are also incorrect. Festival is not a feminine noun in Spanish and should actually be El Festival. Uh, and then uh, island style. I don't know if anyone has ever been to Cabo San Lucas, but we all can tell you from for certain that Cabo is not an island. It is at the tip of the Baja Peninsula. So publishing a piece with the title South to Cabo and making it, uh, marking it island style sends an erroneous message to your students about Mexican geography in a Mexican inspired piece. So here's another popular meme on the subject, right? So when the band director says, hey, play South to Cabo Island style, and your very smart and intelligent student tells you, Cabo Next, I found an arrangement of La Cucaracha, right? Um, it, it says it, that it's a traditional and probably very old Mexican folk song. Uh, dozens of different verses uh, have been added to this popular song over the years, and it is often performed in mariachi ensembles. The crooked rhythmic feel of the song depicts a poor cockroach that reminds me of the clip that we just watched uh, in La Fiesta de Santa Barbara, uh, who is struggling to walk after losing one of his back legs. And students should strive to bring out the syncopation with strong accents and plenty of space, which you know it's ole. Um, this is actually in the website. Like, it's really literally like, online when you buy this stuff, like it's there. This is how they describe it to, to people that are, wanna buy it. Uh, so I think it was all okay for me until I read the expression ole at the end of the description. Uh, this is once again, a careless association of Spanish folklore associated with Mexican inspired repertoire. I mean, ask anyone who is Mexican and they will immediately tell you that when they hear the word ole, they think of Spain and not Mexico. So, uh, this next one is a fiesta for concert band. The title says it all. Uh, yep. Uh, as the excitement and flair of Latin music is fully displayed with this playable yet stylish musical uh, celebration. Use, using two of the most popular and traditional folk selections from Mexico, young players will experience the spirit and rich traditions of our neighbor to the south, complete with Latin percussion. This lively selection features Cielito Lindon, Jarabe Tapatio, while appreciating the rich culture from which they were created. Mucho bueno. <laughs> um, 
So reading Mucho Bueno at the bottom of the description made me just cringe. I mean, I asked myself, who wrote this? And furthermore, like, who let this be published on a website to sell music? If you are a Spanish speaker reading Mucho Bueno, you just, your mind automatically goes to caricature. And Mucho Bueno is not even, right? Mucho Bueno is not even correct Spanish. I should say muy, muy bueno, not mucho bueno. So anyway, let's keep going. If you think that was bad and a little offensive, uh, then wait until I present to you the Dancing Peppers for String Orchestra. And last but not least, the Mexican Jumping Beans for Big Band. Um, so, you know, you know, I think it's really important for me to mention that my intention here is not to disparage any of these arrangers or publishers, but to simply create an awareness of the situation and speak of the existence of these titles and descriptions, especially in the year 2022. You know, I think, I think some of us have probably seen or heard how sheet music from the late 19th century and early 20th century, especially jazz sheet music, often depicted Black Americans in very offensive caricatures. So this has changed, but not so much in me music of Mexican themes. Uh, therefore, it's really important to know this problem still exists today. And so, for example, we have to be aware and speak out in disagreement when we see offensive caricatures in sheet music, like this one. This Mexican hat dance for brass quartet published not long ago in 2015, Behind the title, you can see a really raunchy caricature of a short man with an oversized sombrero and also a big black mustache. So after doing some detective work, I actually found the image they used for this cover art, and it looks like this. Um, yeah. So I, wanna, you know, I just want to lighten things up a little bit here and present positive examples of what I believe are accurate and respectful compositional processes and contextualizations of Mexican-inspired repertoire for instrumental ensembles. I like to talk about Aaron Copeland's El Salón Mexico that, by the way, was written precisely during the Good Neighbor Policy era. And I really like that Copeland visited Mexico several times uh, because he ha he was a goodwill ambassador for during the good neighbor policy, um, and his trips to Mexico were helpful. The, you know, the be they were the best way to understand Mexican culture and sounds. You know, that's the best way to do it: to travel down to Mexico, go to the capital, go to Mexico City, explore its surroundings as a local. And so, uh, as we know, uh, Copeland had a very close relationship with Mexican composer Carlos Chavez for many years and often asked his approval on authenticity. So El Salón Mexico is also a great example of a piece written for orchestra that is not only inspired by Mexican folklore, but also inspired by Mexican urban nightlife. Um, if you want to read more about it, um, I, I really highly recommend this uh, Copeland's own article El Salón Mexico, it is uh, an excellent article exemplifying how American composer approached writing Mexican theme music for orchestra. Another Mexican-inspired piece, um, it's H. Owen Reed's La Fiesta Mexicana, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so I've broken down the pros and cons of this piece in respect to our topic of the day. Some of the pros are that prelude and acid dances, the first movement, draws inspiration from pre-colonial Mexico but probably my favorite thing about this piece is the second movement it is a very somber and reflective piece in this breaking the stereotype that, you know, this jolly, light, trivial holiday music that is really often widely associated with Mexican culture, as we have discussed earlier. Um, also, just like Aaron Copeland, H. Owen Reed spent time in Mexico talking, uh, taking inspiration for this piece. And some of the cons, I think, are pretty obvious. Uh, at this point, the title of the piece continues the fiesta stereotype. And I often wonder, would this piece be as popular today if it had had another title without the word fiesta in it, right? What about Mexican images or uh, Mexican emblems? Um, so I don't know probably not as an exciting or commercial title um, you, without using the word fiesta. 
Um, so next, these are four pieces um, I found on J.W. Pepper that I thought were interesting. Uh, Hanitsu uh, is a piece by uh, the very well-known Mexican composer, Silvestre Revolta. Some of you might know his most famous piece, Sense Maya, that we just actually heard in the clip before this presentation. And I really like the title. I love the accuracy in Mexican geography here, right? Hanitsu is an island in Lake Pascuaro in the state of Michoacan. But unfortunately, the publishers misspelled Michoacan on the website. Uh, um, so next, we have a favorite of the 19th century um, waltz from the Belle Epoque in Mexico. Um, Sobre las Olas is a piece of importance because it transcended into popular culture, into movies, TV shows, etc. And many people do not know it is by a Mexican composer because it doesn't fit into a particular stereotype, like fiesta or like a garacha or Mexican hat dance. And some people say it doesn't sound Mexican, yet it is Mexican because it's written by a Mexican composer. And uh, another wonderful piece by Quentin Rosas that is often overshadowed by the popularity of Sobrella Solas is Valls Carmen, who we are so grateful that we ha now have a new arrangement of this piece by one of our distinguished guests, artists, the symposium. Uh, Rodrigo Martinez is here, uh, and this new arrangement is actually going to be premiered tonight at the Wind Ensemble concert with yours truly conducting, so I encourage everybody to come check it out. Um, so something also, um, something I really like about this next piece, the Tres Danzas de Mexico by Rhodes, is actually its cover art. Um, this is a beautiful image of an Aztec god, right? So it is a great example of important and well done cover art that does not use caricatures. Likewise, the cover art for another piece uh, that is being premiered tonight, um, Little Mexican Sweet by Nubia Don Juan, also has some beautiful cover art. You see that? I love that. Okay. Uh, so shifting gears, just uh, we're uh, I'm going really fast because I know we're short on time, but we're almost uh, there. Uh, shifting gears, are just the, the, so I pose this question: Why is it important for 21st century band, orchestra, and jazz directors to program Mexican-inspired music that is free of stereotypes and caricatures in 2022 and beyond? So I believe the answer is in part that the generation of students we teach today is increasingly more aware of caricatures and stereotypes. This started with Gen Z. For example, one of the core characteristics of Generation Z is racial diversity as America's demographics uh, continue to shift. Gen Z is or was the last generation that is predominantly white. For many Gen Zers, the backdrop of their early years included the country's first black president and the legalization of gay marriage. They are more likely to have grown up amid diverse family structures, whether in a single uh, parent household, a multiracial household, or a household in which gender roles were blurred. So as a result, they are less faced um, than previous generations by uh, differences in race, sexual orientation, or religion. So I think we can all see that our students today are engaging more in activism and matters of social justice. They can easily pick out cringeworthy stereotypes. So I found a really good clip from uh, a TV show Glee that illustrates this. But before I play this video, I want to say that this clip is about 10 years old. So, which actually means that our students today are even more progressive than the characters that we're watching in this clip. I should have known by the looks on my students' faces that I'd really stepped in it. My yearly rendition of La Cucaracha on Taco Tuesday used to be such a hit. The truth is, I'm ashamed. To be a teacher is to offer students a gateway to the future, and I blew it. How could I have become so out of touch? <laughs> It was you. You're the one who complained to Principal Thickens about me. Yeah, and I do it all over again after that performance. 
You're messing with adult things here, Santana. This is my job. Th this is my life. This is my education, and it's not a joke to me, although it seems to be one to you. What are you talking about? They all love my performance. Because they don't know any better. It's your fault. You're their teacher. You went from La Cucaracha to a bullfighting mariachi. Why don't you just dress up as the Taco Bell Chihuahua and bark the theme song to Dora the Explorer? You don't even know enough to be embarrassed about these stereotypes that you're perpetuating. That's not fair. Isn't it? Go on to talk about other things, but that's the... Um, so uh, the question is, where do we go from here? How can composers and arrangers dig deeper into Mexican themes to surpass these overused and stereotypical themes in their arrangements and compositions? Well, I'll start with big picture ideas for possible themes to diversify Mexican theme repertoire past these cringeworthy stereotypes and caricatures. Composers could look at ancient Mexico adopting indigenous and pre-colonial themes. Post-colonial Mexican history is also very interesting. For example, Mexican independence war, the French occupation, Mexican-American war, the Mexican Belle Epoque, the Mexican Revolution. Composers can also draw inspiration from the outstanding work of visual artists like Diego Rivera and his wife Frida Kahlo, or even Jose Clemente Orozco, whose work we saw this morning, and uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros as well. So Mexican pop culture, and in particular telenovelas music, which is not talked a lot, a lot of, about, but is a genre worth pursuing. I'm working hard to get this amazing, some of this amazing music, more recognition. Uh, instrumental, really beautiful instrumental scores to Mexican telenovelas that are really fascinating. Um, but the copyright with television music can be challenging to attain, so uh, keep working on it. Um, I'd say uh, it would be a good idea to avoid overdone tourist themes inspired by resorts like Cancun or Cabo because there's still this stereotype lingering around that Mexico is only about beach resorts. Um, and so another important and relevant question is to ask is what can we do today as directors, conductors in order to contribute to the diversification of Mexican theme repertoire? You know, I, I think it's important to speak out if you discover inaccuracies or microaggressions in websites or cover art like the examples I've presented in, uh, in this presentation, but perhaps a simple and kind email to the publisher making them aware of offensive wording or caricatures would be a good place to start. Furthermore, and most importantly, we need to program and perform muse pieces written by Mexican composers to provide representation. For example, when I was in middle school or high school, I can't think of a piece we played that was written by a Mexican composer, so I never saw myself represented in the authorship of the music I was playing. Sadly, I also can't recall ever having a guest conductor or a clinician of Mexican background when I was in middle school or high school. Uh, so speaking of representation, this is the last thing we're gonna see. Um, uh, I found this video clip of a professional string quartet performing Mexican music for an elementary school music class. Um, the performers in the string quartet are predominantly white and the kids in the class are predominantly Mexican or uh, people of color. Um, and as we watch the clip, I like to focus on how intently and carefully these children are listening and watching these performers. <laughs> freeze the frame because I just like, you, obviously there's no way of knowing what's going on through their mind, right? But you can certainly tell for sure that they are listening, that they are watching, that they're really highly engaged in what's going on in front of them. Um, and... <laughs> My, this is one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, he and he's wearing a sombrero that actually was given to him by the performers earlier. They handed out sombreros. To him. Oh, um, and, you know, I want to be clear that I don't take issue with non-Mexican uh, folks uh, performing Mexican music and uh, bringing it into the classroom. I think it's wonderful that 
people from different backgrounds uh, perform and appreciate Mexican music and furthermore want to inculcate this love to the younger generations. After all, I believe Mexican music belongs to humanity and not one particular race. Um, however, in the year 2022, as we grow more aware of the importance of diversity and inclusion in the society that has a history of systemic racism and oppression, I think we have to be careful to not only program compose and perform music by Mexican composers, but to also invite them into your spaces as guest performers and artists for representation purposes. Invite them into your home and not just to sit and watch you teach or conduct or play, but to participate, to take part, to collaborate. Um, in the case of this particular video clip that we just watched, once again, there is a technically nothing wrong with well-intentioned non-Mexican musicians bringing beautiful music to the classroom. Um, although, do you think it would have been more effective out outreach activity for this particular group of students to have watched a group of Mexican performers that represent and look like them, you know, this way, the students can literally see themselves in the people making the music. They can say, I can be like them when I grow up because they look like me. And this is a powerful message, especially for young children, that I think if we ever have opportunity to, to make that happen, that we should totally take that and run with it. I want to finish uh, with just a quote from uh, Patricia uh, Fison Howland, who's an associate professor of organizational behavior at McGill University. And she states that inclusion isn't that warm and fuzzy feeling of belonging, right? She says that inclusion is actually about being an integral part of a system and being part of the people in the know. And so I think where we are landing today in 2022 is that, yes, it is important to program music by Mexican composers, absolutely. Um, but it is even more important and impactful to invite them into your spaces and bring them in person, to see them, to hear them, their voices, their thoughts, their ideas, what are they wearing, what do they look like? You know, does that sound familiar? Um, so representation matters. And that is why this symposium and its Mexican repertoire initiative is a project I believe in wholeheartedly because I know it will make a difference in the way Mexican music is perceived in the United States and abroad. And so I'm very grateful that this is happening and I really wish that you know we continue to build this relationship because it's a very important. Um, this concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience.